Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, may I have your attention, please? Are you ready to engage in a mind-blowing experience and hear talks about life, technology, entertainment, and business? The next episode of Hip to Talks starts in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, go. Good day, good morning, good evening, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Hipter Talks. Today we're having a very special guest with us, uh, a cool guy that I know from a long, long time ago, uh, the person of Adam Montenden. Hi, Adam. Welcome. Thank you for taking Hi, the Alex. time to join us. Uh, let's shed some light on who is Adam. Oh, that's that's a really good question. Sometimes I don't know myself, but basically I'm British and I'm living and working in Denmark. And what I do really is I help people find really interesting stories and deliver those stories, whether it's on stage, whether it's to an audience, whether it's in pitching, whatever kind of situation you like where you need a really good story. And I help pull stories out of people usually it's the deepest most hidden stories and help them bring them uh, to the stage so that's the short answer of what i do but i also do a lot of other interesting things um beneath the surface as well but i'm sure we'll talk about that as we get yeah, <laughs> that's for sure and one of this uh, these other things that you're doing is uh, the speakers in fact network uh Tell us a little bit more about uh, what's this project of yours, uh, how do people get in touch with uh, with each other through this network, and what's the purpose of, of the project? Oh yeah, that's, that's a really cool question. So I was helping people one-on-one -on -one to come up with new stories and present them in different ways. And I realized that um, so many people needed the, the help and so many people were, um, they were sort of like stuck in their own little world. And I thought, what would happen if I brought together lots of different people from all over the world to find their stories together? So I created two years ago, something called the Speakers Impact Network, where people can log on and uh, we spend time over Zoom talking, learning and working on how we can present our stories better, how we can become better public speakers, or we're just more confident around the office or in meetings or whatever it is where you need to tell a story. So it's great for charities, it's great for businesses, it's great for anybody who's got a passion inside. And the real beautiful thing is, I'm going to be honest, when it comes to public speaking, if when it comes to doing a TED talk, when it comes to standing on a stage in front of hundreds of people, people get terrified. But if you've got a group of friends that you can meet with, every so often and you can share your stories with them and you can get feedback from them and they can get feedback from you even if you're shy and you don't want to say anything at all you can watch somebody else and see how they improve and that inspires you to go uh, even further so it was a really smart idea of bringing people together for something that normally they would do separately because i imagine most people especially when they're in businesses or in that they're in startups and they've got to do a big pitch to some large company the next day they're pacing about and maybe they're looking in the bathroom mirror and practicing in front of the bathroom mirror but the the bathroom mirror is a great place to practice but it doesn't give you any feedback it doesn't tell you what you did right and what you did wrong so i thought let's get out of practicing in front of the bathroom mirror and do it in front of a network of trusted people so now people from all over the world come to speakersimpact.com they join up and they sign up and they have a great time improving and yeah it's super fun so sounds fun and uh, while you were uh, talking about uh, this network I, I was I, I was just thinking about something that uh, uh, I just realized that really helped me on um, in, in getting open uh, we were a group of friends that were playing activity. I suppose you you know that board game. And in the beginning, there were only uh, four or five of us playing that game, and we were a really close circle. Uh, but there was an, an occasion that uh, it was a board game night in some pub, and we were like 30 to 40 people. And uh, I noticed that everybody was quite shy to mimic, to explain, to talk about stuff that... Uh, 
on a day-to-day -day basis when we were playing just as a small circle uh, everything was fine and dandy but when the audience get got larger it was really difficult for me to, and for me as well to uh, express the same uh, things so i really think that this hub uh, is is it okay to call it the hub yeah it, it is a hub um it's it's really uh, wonderful to hear that there are such places that people can connect and get together um also you mentioned uh ted talks um what about them i know that you are involved with uh, tedx um could you could you let us know a little bit more about that as well yeah of course it's a huge passion of mine and for the past seven years i've been working with tedx specifically tedx Unsa, which is a big city in the middle of denmark where i live and uh, what's so fun i'm sure nearly everybody that's listening to your podcast has seen a ted talk or tedx talk at some point they're very uh, interesting very inspirational and they sometimes can be a, a talk that changes your life but the basic idea is that you're sort of taking the most interesting thing that a person knows their biggest idea or their most important idea and compacting it down into just 18 minutes and it's such a challenge because if you've spent years doing a phd discovering something ridiculously complicated and then someone says right you've got to explain it to the world in 18 minutes how do you do that and i love that as a as a challenge and i started here in denmark with a few of my students because uh, i was uh, a teacher at a university here and i said come on let's let's do something what can we what can we do about this and i noticed it was such a big challenge to go from idea to bringing the idea onto the stage that i really like to help people and i came up with a really good ways of understanding how different people share their ideas and how different people deal with confidence on the stage and how they can make that connection with an audience. And I started off working with different speakers one by one by one by one. And then I thought, now I need a bigger team to bring it together. So I got uh, a group of people and I trained them to become speaker coaches and what to listen for, how to write the right story, how to check the facts, how to put everything together. And now it's really wonderful that I get to help lots and lots of people in Denmark, in Germany, in Austria, in Russia, in even Barbados. That was really exciting because there are TEDx events in pretty much every city around the world. So every major city, you can probably find one uh, at some point and you can go along and get inspired and get brilliant ideas from different communities. And the real secret is that you don't have to be a superstar. You don't have to be Bill Gates or Elon Musk. If you've got a really great idea, then a local TEDx team will help you share it. I mean, that's a, an oversimplified way of, of, uh, of saying it. But if you've got a really good idea, um, you can be, we can find even a person waiting for a bus at the side of the street. And that person, if they've got a good idea inside of them, we can take them and put them on the stage and share that idea with millions of viewers. And that's for me, that's super exciting. Yeah, it really sounds, and it sounds like really powerful to just get that uh, that person to go and speak up. And uh, yeah, th this just leads me to to my next question: like uh, taking a random individual from from the street, um, is it a must-have skill or not to to be able to speak in public? That's a great question. And actually, we're seeing more and more the good communication skills and speaking in public are one of the most sought after skills uh, that people are looking for. Now, in fact, uh, Warren Buffett, who does a lot of investing, he writes lots of books on investing, and he still says that the best course that he ever took was not about investing at all, but it was about public speaking. And we sometimes think that public speaking is, yes, yeah, standing on a stage in front of thousands of people but you can use those exact same skills for shooting a 10 second tiktok video or a 20 second instagram shot or what you're saying at the in a meeting or what you're saying around the water cooler or what you're saying in a job interview or what you're saying to your boyfriend or your girlfriend in a way it's all public speaking 
skills. It's all good communication skills. And we really have to develop that, especially now after the COVID pandemic, more and more people are working remotely. We're talking over Zoom. So we're losing a lot of communication. We're losing a lot of body language uh, and all this. So the better you can communicate, the more of a chance you've got to stand out. And of course, you've got to bear in mind when you're communicating, think about how many people are watching now, because if you're talking to uh, just one person, and there's a video camera that's filming it, that camera can put it straight onto YouTube. And you've gone from talking to one person to talking to millions of people in an instant. So we have to be really careful with our words and how we communicate to make sure that we're saying the right thing at the right time like think how many times you've said something and gone oh no that was the wrong thing to say ah oh, no or we uh we hold our tongue a little bit and we hold back or we're nervous about we don't know what to say we don't know how it's going to be received if we've got really good public speaking skills we can forget some of those nerves but for me i would definitely say it's an essential skill and is it safe to assume that uh public speaking is uh I mean, the term public, as you as you explain, it's slowly getting deprecated, like everything is happening online with uh, video cameras. So it seems like public speaking, public speaking, it's getting to sound really redundant. Like in the moment you're getting to speak with someone, this is already public speaking. So uh, and as you mentioned, uh, following up to, to the next question, the, COVID and post-COVID, um, how did this whole tremendous global event that uh, that happened influence the, first, the people's mindset regarding communication and afterwards the, the communication itself? Oh, that's a super great question and lots of parts to it. Firstly, you're absolutely right that almost all public, all, I'll say, say that again, you're absolutely right in that all speaking in a way is public speaking. You're only one click away from sharing your ideas uh, with the world. It's just called public speaking because traditionally that's the set of skills that would go with it. And it's not just speaking. It can be writing as well, choosing your words for writing, whether it's a blog post or whether it's a quote against a sunset on Instagram, whether it's something that you're writing for LinkedIn or even your about us bio, it's a way of communicating publicly. But your second question about what's happened and the changes that COVID has brought, it's brought so many different changes and it's brought changes in two main ways. And they're both terrifying. Um, the first thing is how it's changed what we accept as normal communication because we've moved into this zoom world or this microsoft teams world and it's a whole different set of skills that we're using because now if we're working from home or communicating from home uh it's there's so many things going on in the background it's not that you have your dog barking in the middle of a meeting but now you do it's not like the kids are, are hungry in the middle of a meeting but now they are so you're managing all of these different uh, skills you've got technical skills you've got camera skills you've got all sorts of different things going alongside your public speaking we used to think about oh we've got to dress to impress and what we wear will impress people in the office but now having a better webcam or a better microphone might impress people more than what you wear so there's a whole separate set of skills there but also the scary thing that's happening is thanks to online communication real world communication skills are degrading and what I mean by that is I noticed this incredible phenomenon where I was teaching classes online. And of course, over time, plenty of students like to have their cameras switched off. Or if you ask, are there any questions? It's very easy to put yourself on mute and just uh, be doing something else in the background and not even paying attention. And that's fairly normal in an online environment. If you're talking to hundreds of people for hours and hours, it's understandable. But what happens is we get so used to this kind of behavior that when we're back in the real world, we mimic our online behavior 
in the real world. So what happens is people start switching off mentally more. If you're speaking to an audience, they'll be mentally switched off. If you ask a question, sometimes you'll see people now, they, they don't move and they pretend that they're frozen or that they're <laughs> on mute. And there's no being on mute in the real world. And you'll see people check out of, of meetings. You'll see people almost get bored of a meeting and they'll say, oh, my connection's going, uh, 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 I've got to go. And But like, this is a real meeting. You, you can't walk out so we've we've forgotten some of these core skills and that means that when now if you're running a meeting you have to be really interesting and you have to really grab people's attention and you have to be really efficient with your communication because if you're bored people have got used to having a button that says do leave meeting it's so swipe to the next one ex exactly um so this is this is a massive difference. And what we're going to see is perhaps a generational gap where we've got older, more traditional bosses, managers, investors, people at the top who are used to these face-to-face -face communications. And we're going to have a lot of younger people who've been through um, intense, say, online schooling during COVID or online university during COVID who are used to this uh, switching off mentality. Now, I'm not saying that one is right and one is wrong, or one is better and one is worse. But what I am saying is we're going to have to figure out new ways to deal with it. And the people who are excellent communicators are going to come on top in every way. Because if you're in a group of people and 30 of them are mentally switched off, and you're number 31, and you know how to ask a good question, you know how to listen well, you know how to present yourself well, you're going to skyrocket and leave the rest behind. So this is why like now is a crucial time. Yeah, uh, in, uh, in related to, to what you were saying earlier, we uh, just had a talk with uh, a 17 year old boy. And I was surprised that he was really acknowledging the fact that this generation gap is going to be so much more accented because he was uh, acknowledging the fact that I got a very short attention span. And he was he was explaining like, dude, that all day I'm on TikTok, Facebook shorts, uh, YouTube shorts, Facebook reels, and everything is like, not more than 12 seconds. If you didn't got my attention in the first three seconds, I'm not going to pay attention to what you're saying. Uh, it, it was really shocking to, to learn that they know this. Because, okay, if something happens, if uh, something is transforming and you're not aware of that, you can be easily seen as, let's say, a victim of, of the transformation itself. But the fact that you're acknowledging this, and he was really looking at me and saying, like, there's nothing you can do. It's not my fault. It's not your fault. It's just in between. And uh, it is going to be really, really challenging to, to, to cover this gap or to try to cover it. Because right now, it's going more and more steep uh, as, I, as I see it. And uh, this, again, leads me to my next question. How do you coach? How do you oh. teach someone to speak, to express themselves, to be better at communicating? Oh. That's a really good question. And I've, I'd like to build on what you said about the, the timeline, because it's so interesting when you're saying, yeah, if you're on YouTube Shorts or TikTok, you've got just a few seconds. It's funny for me, because a lot of experts will spend two hours giving a lecture and explaining something and then if we have to put it into 18 minutes not so long ago for a ted talk 18 minutes was seen as short and snappy and fast now if i tell a young person oh watch this video oh really 18 minutes that's too long uh, that's too long for me but an interesting thing is you're right in that people are watching this content very quickly but they're watching this content for hours and hours and hours even though it's only 10 seconds at a time and sometimes on a weekend we We'll open up our Netflix or our favorite streaming service and we'll say, oh, I don't want to watch a, a movie that lasts an hour and a half, but I'll happily binge 10 hours of, of series nonstop. Yep. And what's really great is we, we can have the capacity to be fast and communicate quickly, but we can also have the capacity to communicate 
in depth. And if we can hold people for a long time, that's also a real skill. So that's two different skills. Um, it's not that the whole world has to get you quick. You can get someone quick, but can you hold their attention for a long time? Can you be the series where people are waiting for, come on, next episode, next episode, I want more, more, more. When they're demanding more content from you, that's when you know you've got something really special. But speaking about coaching people, the process that I take people through is really exciting. It's something that I developed over a period of years. And what I realized is that everybody is different. Everybody is different. There is not a one size fits all way for coaching. And the biggest problem was so many people get a little bit nervous. Let's say you've got a big presentation coming up and maybe you can present okay. You're, um, you're not so afraid of an audience or anything like that but you want to do the best job that you possibly can. So you'd go into Google and you'd type how to give a good presentation. And you get the same advice all the time. You would say, oh, if you're nervous, take a deep breath. Uh, make sure your PowerPoints are nice and, and clear. Uh, write down your plan before you say it, you know, these kind of things. And it's like, if everybody did that, then everybody would be um, perfect public speakers. No, no, no. It's different for everybody because... If you follow the same, uh, the same, uh, the same sequence as somebody else, you're going to end up sounding the same as them. And one of the things that I see so much, it's really funny, is a lot of people love Steve Jobs and the way that Steve Jobs used to present when he presented for, for business. And I'll see so many people almost pretending to be Steve Jobs because they've watched a few of his videos and they're like, oh, I'll just copy that. And they'll end with, oh, there's one more thing like Steve always used to do. And the, what's really funny about that is then it looks like it's almost like karaoke but for public speaking. And the last thing that you want to do is pretend to be like somebody else, right? You don't, don't pretend to be like Steve Jobs. Don't pretend to be like whoever your hero is. The real trick is to be yourself and bring the best sides of yourself when you're speaking. So how I coach people is I take people through seven different steps and we go step by step. And I'll be honest, it's hard work. It takes about a month to go through each step. And the first thing that we do is we really figure out who you are as a person, because if you try to speak in a different way than who you are, it's going to end in disaster. And I'll give you a really good example of this. If you've ever been to any wedding ever, there's always some nice speeches at the wedding. And there's always an uncle it's always an uncle and he's always a little bit drunk and he decides to do a speech and he thinks he's the biggest comedian ever. And he thinks he's so funny. He should be doing a Netflix special or something. And he's not funny. He's just drunk and he acts like he's the biggest comedian and he can't understand why people aren't laughing at all of his terrible jokes. And if you've ever sat through a drunken uncle at a wedding speech, you'll know the whole audience is cringy and they're looking at their watch and like, when's this going to end? Because I actually here the uncles don't give speeches, but we do have that drunk uncle at each <laughs> wedding. But <laughs> thankfully, they, they don't give speeches. Oh, I, you're, I exactly, you're very lucky. In, I know in exactly Denmark, what you're uh, talking about. Drunk uncles love to give speeches, I've got to tell you. But the the trick with it is to know that um, if you're not a comedian, you don't have to be funny. You don't have to end up like Michael Scott in the office trying to be an entertainer. If you're not an entertainer, you don't have to pretend to be Steve Jobs. So what I love to do is ask the right questions about who the person really is, what really gets them exciting, what's inside their spirit. And so how can they feel more comfortable being themselves on stage? Because oftentimes when we're talking to our friends, when we're talking to our closest friends or our closest family, we can be natural, we can be honest, and we can be understood. Everybody has that one best friend who just knows what you're thinking before you're even thinking it, right? You don't even have to say anything. You can just give them the nod and they know what's, what's going on. And But we can do that with our best friends, maybe two or three or five of our closest family members, but we can't do that with everybody. So how do we understand that personal intimate connection that we have with our friends? 
and then treat the audience like it's not an audience of 100 people, it's an audience of 100 of our closest, most personal friends. And when you get that, when you can talk like that in that honest, open way, you can build such a strong connection. And that's the basis of my coaching. Sounds really interesting. And uh, honestly, it sounds way different than, uh, uh, yeah, exactly what you said, uh, write down your notes, uh, empty your mind, take a deep breath, stuff like that. But I know that one of the, of the most difficult and the most challenging uh, things to get over is stage fright. Like, I know people that are good speakers. Uh, I know people who are really, really cerebral with their ideas. Everything is fine and dandy until they're up on a stage. And there, they just lose it. There's freezing, there's stuttering, there's everything. How do you handle that? And how do you win against stage fright? Well, that's a really great question because stage fright is a bigger fear than spiders, than heights, than snakes, than almost anything. And for me, a little bit of fear is healthy. It means that you care. So you don't want to get rid of your nerves completely, but you want to get rid of 99% of them and just have like a little, a little bit of excitement rather than nerves and what i often think about when i'm speaking is i'm thinking about three different things i'm thinking about am i prepared am i well practiced and am i going to perform and realistically you get rid of 99 percent of your nerves in the preparation part and the truth is most people just do not prepare enough the more that you prepare and the more different ways that you prepare, the better you're going to be able to perform. Because oftentimes the reason why we're nervous is we could be worried about a hundred different things. What if I forget my words? What if I look stupid? What if someone asks me a question that I don't know? What if there's somebody in the audience who doesn't like me? Will they laugh at my jokes? Will they cheer for me at the end? Am I going to keep them engaged? There's a hundred different things running through your head. If you take all of those things and prepare for every single one of them through a checklist. What happens if your laptop breaks? What happens if you forget the words? What happens? And have a good way that you're going to recover from each and every one of them. Then there's less and less and less to worry about and you can go through it no problem. And usually people will prepare. If I'm coaching them, they'll prepare for a hundred things to go wrong. And maybe during their speech, only two things will go wrong. So you don't see the 98 other things. And then you would think, well, why would I ever worry about preparing for these things that are never going to happen? It's because they happen not on the stage, they happen in your imagination. And your imagination knows exactly what you're scared of. And your imagination can be your biggest tool, but it can also be your worst enemy when you're nervous. And so what I do in the Speakers Impact Network is we have... Um, checklists that you can download where you can literally go through and tick off all of these little things and so you say right i've got this problem i've got the solution tick got the problem solution tick 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 and by the time you get to the end you're like okay i've done it there's nothing left to worry about all i've got to do now is perform and yeah fear is different for everybody but there's a hundred different ways to get over it and it's finding the things that work for you and the things that work for you are probably not take a deep breath have some <laughs> notes written down like it's probably not that it's perhaps much deeper yeah most likely everyone can take a deep breath i mean people do have to breathe the, the trouble comes from from another point so yeah exactly. uh, adam uh any closing advice or uh a good punchline for our audience in, in, related, of course, to, to public speaking. Sure. I think the most important thing for your audience to remember is that words are so ridiculously powerful. Words can make us fall in love, but words can also start a war. And it's down to you to choose your words with the respect of all of the power that they have behind them. Because you will say something that can change a person's life. And there's probably been people in your life that have said something that has changed your life. 
and that other person might not ever even remember saying it. So treat your words like the luxury product that they are. Talk is cheap, but change is powerful and the right words can bring the right change. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot imagine anything else I could add to that. Man, that's so strong. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Adam, for taking the time to join us. Thank you to our audience who's tuning in from uh, whatever platform are you doing this. But if you're not happy with it, remember, you can choose from almost 15 other platforms. You can find them all on hipter.com slash podcast. Thank you once again and see you next week. Thank you for joining. Be sure to check back next week for the next Hip to Talks and subscribe on Amazon Music, Overcast, Spotify, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, and Pandora.